This is a Puritan and Reformed audiobook podcast. The following sermon is Maintaining Faith When the Love of the Many Around Has Grown Cold or The Use of Faith In a Time of General Declension in Religion Habakkuk 2.4 The Just Shall Live by His Faith I now come to the last thing that was proposed to be spoken to and with which I shall shut up the subject, namely, how we may live by faith under an apprehension of great and woeful decays in churches, in church members, in professors of all sorts, and in the gradual withdrawing of the glory of God from us all on that account. I would speak to three things. Number one, that this is such a time of decay among us, among churches, among church members and professors of all sorts and ways throughout this nation, yea, and other nations too, where there are any that fear God. Number two, that this is and ought to be a cause of great trouble and trial unto all that are true believers. And thirdly, I shall show you how we may live by faith in such a season, what it is faith will do to support the soul at such a time. That it is now such a time of decay, there are too many evidences of it. I will name a few things first. A sense of it is impressed upon the minds of all the most judicious and diligent Christians that abound most in self-examination or take most notice of the ways of God. Multitudes have I heard testifying of it. Complaints are received from many in this nation and in neighboring nations, that there is a great decay as to the power of grace and life of faith among all sorts of professors. And some of them will go further in their evidence and tell us that they find the effects of it in themselves, that they find it a manner of great difficulty, requiring great watchfulness and great diligence in any measure to keep up themselves to their former frames, and when they have done all, they do not attain their desire. And to increase this evidence. We are all convinced of it, or else we are all notorious hypocrites. For I know not how often I have heard it prayed over in this very place, so that there is sent forth from God a conviction upon the hearts and minds of spiritual self-examining believers, the churches, church members, professors, and themselves are under spiritual decays. This is the first evidence. And therefore, in such a season, it was the best part of the church that made that sad complaint. In Isaiah 53.17 O Lord, why have you made us to err from your ways, and harden our heart from your fear? They were sensible that there was a judgment of the hand of God upon them. Number two, the open want of of love that is among churches, among church members, among professors, is another evidence of decay. I will not speak of the want of love among churches one to another, but as to love among church members, we have scarce a shadow of it remaining among us. Where men have relations, where they have acquaintance, where they have been old friends, where they agree in humor and converse, there is an appearance of love And where they agree in a party and faction, there is an appearance of love. But upon the pure spiritual account of Christianity and church membership, we have, I say, scarce a shadow of it left among us. I remember how it was with us when it was a joy of heart to behold the face of one another, wherein there was love without dissimulation, insincerity, love attended with pity, compassion, condescension, a love attended with delight, but it is dead in churches, dead among professors. Number three. Another evidence of this decay is want of delight and diligence in the ordinances of gospel worship. These ordinances were wont to be a joy of heart unto all that feared God, but now there is so much deadness, coldness, and indifferency so much undervaluing of the word, self-fullness, pride, and so much an apprehension that we know everything, so little endeavor to tremble at every truth, by what means soever it be brought unto us, 
as gives a manifest evidence of woeful decays that are fallen upon us. Dead preachers, dead hearers, all things now go down among the churches of God and professors in these nations. And this is attended with two desperate evils, one of which I heard of but lately. But upon inquiry I find it to be a far greater evil than I took it to be, namely, men, under an apprehension that they do not see others enlivened nor quickened as they were wont to be by the ordinances of divine worship, and finding no such thing in their own hearts, neither in all probability finding themselves to grow dead and useless, are fallen into an opinion that there is an end of them, and that they ought to attend unto them no more. And this does befall some that have long walked soberly and with great diligence in the use of ordinances. Some in this city, and in other places, are led by foolish delusions to it, because they do not find the spirit and life and power of the word and ordinances in themselves, and as they think, in others. A godly and learned minister that showed me a discourse written upon the subject, in defense of ordinances, did acquaint me with so great a number fallen into this abomination that I did not think it had been possible. This is one of the evils. The other evil that attends it is this, that this deadness and indifferency unto ordinances and want of bringing our necks to the yoke of Christ in it against all disputings and arguings of flesh and blood has taken such place among us, and proceeded so far that all ways of reformation are useless. Men may make divisions, and do I know not what, but this I know, there is no way of obtaining any reformation but for men to engage their hearts to return unto God, and more delight in his service than there has been. Some utterly forsake the assemblies, some come with great indifferency, using their liberty off and on at their pleasure. Are not these things evidences of great decays among us? To me they are. I speak not as to this congregation in particular, but as to the state of all churches that I know or can hear of in these nations. Number four. The last evidence I shall mention of these decays among us is our worldly mindedness, conformity to the world and security. These things have been so often spoken to you, and no reformation has ensued that now they are looked upon as words of course, and I am discouraged from speaking of them any more. But assure yourselves this conformity to the world and the security that is yet found among us is a great evidence that the glory of God is departing from us. Ministers preach against worldly mindedness, carnal security, and so on, but it makes no impression upon the minds of men, for we can scarce give an instance of any, the least reformation. These things plainly demonstrate that we are all under great decays. Number two, a sense of this general decay among churches, church members, and professors ought to be an exercise and concern unto our minds. If we think all is well with us and are satisfied while we are free from outward troubles and do not concern ourselves about our decays, I will not say we are hypocrites, but truly we are poor, low, dead, carnal, unspiritual Christians. I thought to have spoken to thee three heads to show you first how God is dishonored by this general decay. Number two, how the world is offended and scandalized at it. Number three, how the ruin of churches is hastened by it, which will befall them assuredly unless God recover us out of this bad state. But I shall waive these things and proceed. Thirdly, suppose it be thus, and we do complain of it to one another, not knowing what the issue will be, nor what it may come to. How shall we live by faith under this consideration? What is the work of faith in this state? If things are so, and I wish any one could evidence they are not, but suppose for once that they are so, and our souls are burdened with an apprehension that they are so, then what will faith do to enable us to pass through this exercise and to live to God? I will tell you something of what I find, and if God help you not to better things, make use of these and improve them, 
that you may give glory to God by believing under this condition also. Faith will mind a soul that notwithstanding this also, yet Christ has built his church upon that rock, that it shall not be utterly prevailed against. The promise, saith faith, extends itself as well as to the inbred adversaries of our own souls. Unbelief, deadness, and all these things as to our outward enemies. Matthew 16.18 Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Though we were all dead, helpless, lifeless, poor creatures, though we had retained almost nothing but outward order, and had lost a very vigor and essence of faith and obedience, yet Christ's church shall abide and stand, and those that belong to him shall be preserved. Such and such are turned apostates, saith the Apostle, Second Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth, sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. Here is my ground of hope, notwithstanding all this. Though one falls after another, though one decays after another. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth, sure, and it has a seal upon it. The Lord knows them that are his. Every one whom he has effectually called and built upon the rock, Jesus Christ, shall be preserved, whatever befalls the residue of the world. To see such a confluence of all manner of dangerous evils from without as are coming this day upon the church of God, and to see in the meantime so many evidences of a decaying spiritual state in believers themselves, it will put faith to exercise itself upon this promise of Christ. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If you find your spirits at any time pressed with these things, if nothing better occurs at hand, exercise faith upon this promise of Christ, and upon the firm standing of the foundation of God, that he knoweth who are his, and will carry them through all these difficulties and land them safe in eternity. Number 2. Faith will also mind the soul that God has yet the fullness and residue of the Spirit, and can pour it out when he pleases, to recover us from this woeful state and condition, and to renew us to holy obedience unto himself. There are promises of God's giving supplies of his Spirit to deliver us from inward decays. Then there are for the putting forth the acts of his power to deliver us from our outward enemies. And God is able to do the inward work, to revive and renew a spirit of faith, love, and holiness, of meekness, humility, self-denial, and readiness for the cross. He is able with one word and act of his grace to renew it, as he is able by one act of his power to destroy all his enemies and make them the footstool of Christ when he pleases. Live in the faith of this. The psalmist saith, He scattereth the hoarfrost, and the issue is, the earth is frozen. Psalm 147, 16 and 17 He brings a death upon it, but he saith in Psalm 104, 30, Thou sendest forth thy spirit, and thou renewest the face of the earth. In like manner there is a deadness upon all churches and professors in some measure at this time. But God, who hath the fullness of the Spirit, can send him forth and renew the face of the soul, can give professors and profession another face, not to trim and trick, as now so often is done, not so high and haughty, not so earthly and worldly, as is now so much seen, but humble, meek, holy, broken-hearted, and self-denying. God can send forth his spirit when he pleases and give all our churches and professors a new face and a verdure and flourishing of his grace in them. When God will do this, I know not, but I believe God can do this. He is able to do it, able to renew all his churches by sending out supplies of the spirit whose fullness is with him to recover them in the due and appointed time. And more, I believe truly, that when God has accomplished some ends upon us, and has stained the glory of all flesh, he will renew the power and glory of religion among us again, even in this nation. I believe it truly, 
but not as I believe the other things I have mentioned unto you, for those I believe absolutely, namely, that Christ has built his church upon a rock, and that nothing shall ever finally prevail against it, and that God hath a fullness in the residue of the Spirit to renew us again to all the glory of profession and holy obedience. These I propose as truths that are infallible, that will not fail you, and upon which you may venture your souls to eternity. And if your faith in these things will not give you support and comfort, I know not what else will. Number three. When your souls are perplexed within you about these things, your faith will say unto you, O my soul, why art thou cast down? Are not all these things foretold thee? 1 Timothy 4, 1. That in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. That in the last days perilous time shall come, because men should have a form of godliness, but deny the power. Has it not been foretold that churches shall decay and lose their first faith and love, and examples that have been set before you? Why are you surprised? Saith our Savior, John 16, verse 4. These things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. I was never near a surprisal than by this one thing, how it could possibly be, that after so many instructions, after so many mercies, trials, and fears, after so many years carrying our lives in our hands, and so many glorious deliverances, there should yet be decay found amongst us, and such going backward. It is a great surprise to one that considers it aright. But seeing it is foretold that so it shall be, let us live by faith. God has some great end to accomplish out of it, and then all will be well. When I have performed my whole work upon Mount Zion, saith God, then, and so on, Isaiah 10:12, 4. And lastly, faith, if it be an exercise, will put every soul in whom it is upon an especial attendance unto those duties God calls them to in such a season. This accomplishes and completes our living by faith under such a trial as this is. If faith be in us, and in exercise, it will put us upon all these duties that God requires of us in such a season. First, it will put us upon self-examination, how far we ourselves are engaged in these decays and have contracted the guilt of them. Secondly, it will put us upon great mourning by reason of God's withdrawing himself from us. Thirdly, it will put us upon watchfulness over ourselves, and over one another, that we be not overtaken by the means and causes of these decays. Fourthly, it will put us upon zeal for God and the honor of the gospel, that it may not suffer by reason of our miscarriages. In one word, faith will do something, but for our parts we do little or nothing. Faith will do something, I say, wherever it is, when it is stirred up to exercise. But as to these special duties in reference to these decays that all professors are fallen under, oh, how little is it we do in any kind whatever. Would we might advise with one another what to do under these decays, to further one another in recovering ourselves from them. This, then, is what we are called to and is required of us, namely, faith in the faithfulness of Christ who has built his church upon the rock, so that, be things never so bad, it shall not be prevailed against. Faith in the fullness of the Spirit, and has promised to send him to renew the face of the church. Faith in apprehending the truth of God, who has foretold these things, and faith putting us upon those special duties that God requires at our hands in such a season. I'm going to complete this recording by reading chapter 10 of the nature and causes of apostasy, other to causes and occasions of the decay of holiness by John Owen. Multitudes are led into and countenanced in the ways of sin and profaneness, freely indulging to their lusts and corrupt affections by a false appropriation of justifying names and titles to them and ways of sin and wickedness. This is one principal means of old in which the Jews were hardened in their impieties and flagitious lives. For when the prophets told them of their sins and warned them of God's approaching judgments, they opposed that outcry to their whole ministry. 
the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Say what you please. We are the only posterity of Abraham, the only church of God in the world. This contest they managed with the prophet Jeremiah, and in a special manner. Chapter 7. He saith unto them in the name of the Lord, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Verse 3. Their reply in defense is, The temple of the Lord, and so on. Verse 4. Whereunto the prophet makes that severe return. Verses 9 and 10. Will you still murder and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal? And walk after other gods whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name? Will you give up yourselves unto all manner of wickedness, and countenance yourselves therein by being a people unto whom the temple and the worship of it are appropriated? And this, in like manner, was the great prejudice which the Baptists had to contend with when it came to call them to repentance. Abraham's children they were, and by virtue of that relation had right unto all the privileges of the covenant made with him, whatever they were in themselves. Matthew 3, verse 9. And it is evident in these examples that the nearer churches or persons are unto an utter forfeiture of all their privileges, and to destruction itself, for their sins, the more ready they are to boast of and support themselves with their outward estate, as nothing else to trust to. But if men were able to countenance themselves and their sins on this pretense against that extraordinary prophetical ministry which endeavored to discard them of it and call them unto the necessity of personal holiness, how much more will they be able to shelter themselves under its shades when they shall be taught so to do? When men who have given up themselves unto a vicious, sensual, worldly course of life, having either fallen into it by the power of their lust and temptations, or were never brought into a better course by any means of correcting the vices of nature, they shall find that notwithstanding what they are, what they know themselves to be, and what judgment others must needs pass of them, yet they are esteemed to belong to the Church of Christ and are made partakers of all the outward privileges of it. It cannot but greatly heighten their security in sin, and weaken the efficacy of all means of their reformation. And when others, not so engaged in the ways of sin and profaneness, shall see that they may have all the external pledges of divine love and favor communicated to them, although they should run into the same compass of riot and excess with others, it cannot but insensibly weaken their diligence and duty, and render them more pliable subjects of temptations to sin. For they are but few who care to be better than they judged they must be of necessity. When the church of Sardis was really dead, the principal means of keeping it in that condition was the name it had to be alive. Let us, therefore, consider how it has been in the world in this matter. Whilst these things have been communicated promiscuously unto all sorts of men, yea, to the worst that live on the earth, is it not evident that the name of the church and the administration of its ordinances would be made use of to countenance men in the neglect of holiness, yea, a contempt and hatred of it? Whilst these sacred names, titles, and privileges, these pledges of the love of God and of all the benefits of the mediation of Christ, are forced to lackey after men into the most provoking courses of flagitious sins, what can put a stay to the lusts of men? If the church be that society in the world, which is alone the object of God's special love and grace, if the principal end of the administration of its ordinances be to confirm unto men their interest in the benefits of the mediation of Christ, how can the lusts of men be more accommodated than by the application of these things to them, while they are flagrant in their pursuit? It may indeed be supposed that the Lord Jesus Christ has made evangelical obedience to be the immovable rule of an interest in his church. Indeed, whether obedience unto the precepts of the gospel be not the only and indispensable condition of a participation of the privileges of the gospel, ought to be out of dispute with them that own the truth of its doctrine. And whereas all that is required of us that we may be eternally saved is contained in the precepts of the gospel, men can have no other outward security of their soul's welfare than what doth accompany the church in its rites. 
When therefore they do find on what easy terms they may hold an indefeasible interest in them, so as that, by a compliance with some outward forms or constitutions, they must secure their right from any impeachment or forfeiture by the most profligate course of life which, for the satisfaction of their lusts, they can betake themselves to, what remains of outward means that can put a restraint upon them. This is the engine in which Satan promoted that general apostasy from evangelical obedience which befell the Church of Rome and all its branches, members, and adherents. For after that innumerable multitudes were brought to the profession of Christianity, not through a conviction and experience of its truth, power, holiness, and necessity unto the present peace and eternal welfare of the souls of men, but in compliance with the rulers of the nations and their own secular interest, being once safely lodged on most easy and gentle terms in the church, they were quickly secured from all apprehensions of the necessity of that holiness which the gospel requires. For being assured that although their lives were worse than those of the heathen, were they never so lewd, filthy, and wicked, did all manner of sins that may be named or ought not to be named abound among them? Yet that they and they alone were the church of Christ and could not be otherwise, to what purpose should they trouble themselves with mortification? self-denial, purity of heart and hands, and such other ungrateful duties. What ground is there to expect the same course of obedience from them who engage into a profession of Christianity on these terms, with those who in the primitive times embrace the truth and the love of it, for its own sake, with a deliberate resolution to forego all things rather than forsake its profession or decline from its commands? especially were men confirmed in their security when they saw others condemned body and soul unto hell and consumed with fire and sword in this world for not being what they were, that is, the church. They could not choose but applaud their own happiness, who on such easy terms were certainly freed from present and eternal flames, when hereunto for the necessary satisfaction of some convictions the release of confession, penances, commutation, and redemption of sins by outward works of supposed piety or charity were found out, with a great reserve of purgatory in all dubious cases, the generality of men bade an open farewell unto the holiness of the gospel, as that wherein they were not concerned and wherewith they would not be troubled. Any things consisted the mystery of iniquity, the springs and occasions of that great apostasy which was in the world under the papacy. Number one. The doctrine of the gospel as to its peculiar nature, the causes, motives, and ends of it, was generally lost, partly through the horrible ignorance of some, and partly through the pernicious errors of others whose duty it was to have preserved it. And how impossible it is to maintain the life and power of obedience when the spring of it is dried up or corrupted, when this root is withered and decayed, is not hard to apprehend. Sometimes truth is lost first in the church and then holiness, and sometimes the decay or hatred of holiness is the cause of the loss of truth, but where either is rejected, the other will not abide, as we have declared. And so it fell out in that fatal apostasy, these evils promoted and furthered each other. Number two, the ground got by the loss of truth was secured by the application of the name, title, privileges, and promises of the church unto all sorts of men, though living impenitently in their sins. For there was, and is virtually contained therein, an assurance given unto them that they are in that condition in which the Lord Christ requires that they should be, which he accepts, approves, and has annexed the promises of the gospel, too. When men are declared to be in this estate, what need they be at any pains or charge to have it changed or bettered? Certainly, in general, they are too much in love with their lusts, sins, and pleasures to part with them, unless they see a greater necessity for it than such a condition would admit. And for their further security in this, they were informed that the sacraments of the church did, by virtue of their administration alone, confer unto them all the grace which they signify. Particularly they were taught to believe that every one who had a mouth, whatever villainies his heart and life were filled with, might eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus Christ, at least by concomitancy, which himself has assured us that 
Whoso doeth hath eternal life, John six fifty three and 54, and other ways almost innumerable that were whereby, through their pretended interest in the church and its privileges, even flagitious sinners were secured of immortality and glory. For the increase of their satisfaction, for the confirming of their security, they found that hell and destruction were denounced only against them who were not of the church. For besides one great maxim of truth which passed current amongst them, but was falsely applied unto their advantage, namely, that out of the church there was no salvation, which church they were, and one also of no less use to them, though of less truth in itself, that the church was like Noah's ark, all were saved that were in it, and all drowned that were out of it. With others of an alike encouraging nature, they saw the truth of them exemplified before their eyes. For if it so fell out that there were any who did not belong to the church as they did, nor we comply with it, although they were evidently in their ways and lives more righteous than themselves, they saw them by the authority of the church cursed, condemned to hell, cast into dungeons and consumed with flames, and herewith they could not but be fully satisfied that there was no fear of danger and trouble in this world or another, but only in not being of the church, which then they were resolved not to be guilty of, seeing they could avoid it on so easy terms. And it will be found always true that his persecutions with the sufferings of the saints of God do tend to the brightening of the grace of some, and the confirmation of the faith of others who really believe, so they do greatly unto the obdurateness and impenancy of wicked men in their sins. Never was there a more pernicious engine against the glory of the gospel invented than for professed Christians to persecute, hurt, and destroy others in like manner. But these privileges and these attestations were not absolutely and always such armor of proofs unto sinners, but that some arrows of conviction would ever and anon pierce into their minds and consciences, giving them no small disquietment and trouble. One thing or other, either in some beam of truth from the gospel or from conscience itself, on the occasions of new surprisals into actual sin or from fear or an apprehension of some public judgments, would ever and anon befall them, that unto an inward disturbance beyond what the advantages mentioned could reduce them from. And this is the most likely way of awakening them out of their security, and causing them to inquire what God yet required of them. In this case were the other helps and supplies mentioned found out and proposed to them, if it be so that you are not absolutely satisfied with your interest in the advantages of the church in general. If sin will yet give you any disquietment, then you must, to confession and penances and works of redemption, with alike approved medicines and remedies for troubled minds. But if the conscience of any proves so stubborn and inflexible after all these mollifying and supplying medicines, that the wound will not be skinned over, all that is yet wanting shall be well issued and secured in purgatory, wherein it is most certain that never any soul did miscarry. By these and the like means, the generality of mankind were brought into an utter unconcernment with gospel holiness. They neither understood it, nor found any need of it, nor did like what by any means they might hear of it, until at length a blind devotion, deformed with various superstitions, obtained the reputation of it. The world in the meantime being drenched in ignorance, profaneness, and all manner of wicked conversation, so under the name of the church and its privileges were Christ and the gospel almost utterly lost amongst men. It will not be otherwise where the same principles are entertained according to the degrees of their prevalency. And were it not that the minds of men are powerfully influenced with reserves from these things, it were impossible that so many called Christians should in their lives and conversations succeed heathens and Mohammedans in wickedness. The commands of the gospel are most holy, its promises great, and its threatenings most severe, and yet under a profession of owning them all, men lead lives worse than the heathens who know nothing of that holy rule, or of those promises and threats of eternal things wherein the highest blessedness and utmost misery of our nature consist, which these profess to be regulated by. To suppose really the least countenance to be given hereunto by anything that belongs to the gospel is to exercise against it the highest despite imaginable. 
This event, therefore, must and doth principally follow on the undue application of the outward tokens of God's favor and pledges of eternal blessedness unto men in their sins, by those unto whom the administration of them is supposed to be committed by Jesus Christ. And let none expect a return of a conversation becoming the gospel among Christians until things are so ordered in the church, as that none may flatter themselves with a supposed interest in the promises and privileges of the gospel, who live not in a visible subjection and to in compliance with all the precepts of it. But while all things are huddled together promiscuously, and there is no more required to make a Christian than for him to be born in such a place or nation, and not to oppose the customs and usages in religion which are there established, we must be content to bear the evils of that defection which the world groans under. Great examples of persons exalted in places of eminency, given up themselves unto boldness in the course of sinning, which have fallen out in all the latter ages of the church, have had a signal influence into the increase and furtherance of this apostasy. Especially they have had so, where the persons given such examples have been such as pretended to the conduct of religion. See Jeremiah 23.15 it cannot with any modesty be denied, but that the flagitious, scandalous lives of many popes and other great prelates of the court of Rome have hurried many into the very depths of atheism, and countenance multitudes in a careless, voluptuous, sensual course of life. And if at any time a man whose ways are made conspicuous by the imminency of his employment, being as it were at the head of all the religion that is publicly professed, and having the chief conduct of it in his hand, as it is in the papacy in many places, be vain in his communication, profane in his principles, sensual in his course of life, negligent in the duties of his office, no way rebuking open sins, but taking pleasure in them that do them, it is incredible how soon a whole age or generation of professed Christians will be influenced, corrupted, and debauched by it. For what is a family like to be when the stewards are such as the evil servant described in Matthew twenty four forty eight to 51 As men are warned every day not to be wiser than their teachers, but duly to obey their guides, so they either cannot or will not for the most part see any reason why they should be better than they or walk in any other paths than what they tread before them. When the sons of Eli, the sons and successors of the high priest, actually exercising the priest's office in their own persons, gave the people an open example of profaneness and lewdness of life, the body of the nation was quickly so far corrupted as that the judgments of God in the first captivity of the land ensued thereon. The world at present is so precipitate and headstrong in a course of sin that the best examples are not able in any measure to stem the torrents of it. But if in any place at any time encouragements are given unto men by any eminent examples in sinning, helping to remove the remaining curbs of fear, shame, and reputation, impudence in sinning will rise unto an exorbitant and uncontrollable outrage. Hereby, then, has the defection from holiness complained of been greatly promoted in all ages, for a few or none of them have wanted plenty of these examples. Indeed, the first visible degeneracies of Christianity as they accompanied, so they were occasioned by the open pride, ambition, strife, contentions, and conformity unto the world, that possessed the minds and stained the lives of far the greatest part of prelates and principal leaders of the church, after it came under the protection of the Roman Empire, and men thought to purchase an interest in the good things of religion, or at least a representation of them, by giving power, wealth, and honor unto persons no way better than themselves, who got the name and title of the clergy, or guides of the church, for about these things they contended endlessly, to the shame of Christian religion, and the utter loss and the most of the true real power and virtue of it. And in following ages, as things grew worse and worse, the lewd and wicked lives of popes, prelates, and others, signalized unto the world by their power and dignity, did by their examples insensibly bring about a public conformity to their vices, according as a concurrence of opportunity and ability did enable men thereunto. Wherever, therefore, persons fall within the compass of the ministry of the church, or as guides of it, or on that account, on what principle soever, 
exalted into places of eminence or dignity, whereby they are made conspicuous and observable, if they do not proportionably excel such a godly conversation as truly expresses the grace of the gospel, in humility, meekness, contempt of the world, of sensual pleasures and of the pride of life, zeal and diligence in the dispensation of the word, it cannot be but that apostasy from the gospel as to its power and holiness will be kept up and promoted. Want of watchfulness against the insinuation of national vices and the prevailing sins of any present age has effectually promoted an apostasy from evangelical holiness among the generality of Christians. There are some vices, crimes, or sins that particular nations, on what grounds I shall not now inquire, are peculiarly inclined to, which therefore abound in them, for it is evident what great advantages those vices must have on the minds of men, and how easy it is to have their practice imposed on them. All men are continually encompassed with them in their occasions, and commonness takes off the sense of their guilt. That which would be looked on in one nation as the greatest debauchery of human nature is through custom in another pass by without any animadversion. Hence the prevalency of the gospel in any nation may be measured by the success it hath against known national sins. If these are not in some good measure subdued by it, if the minds of men be not alienated from them and made watchful against them, if their guilt appear not naked without the varnish or veil put upon it by commonness or custom, whatever profession is made of the gospel, it is vain and useless. Titus one twelve and 13, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Decretions are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Whatever their professions were, if they were not delivered by the gospel from the power and practice of these national sins, which they were so prone to, they would not long be sound in the faith, nor fruitful in obedience. So among the Jews there was a peculiar kind of stubbornness and obstinacy, above any other nation under heaven, which God complains of in their successive generations from first to last, and which continues to be their characteristical evil to this day. Hence Josiah was eminently committed because his heart was tender, Second Chronicles 34.27. He was not under the power of the common sin of that people, which indeed includes all other evils whatever. It was a very rare thing to find one of a tender heart among them. And we may observe it being easily demonstrable that the great apostasy which is at this day among the nations which have received the Christian religion consists in a degeneracy into those customs, manners, humors, and courses of conversation which were common among them and national before the entrance of Christianity, set aside an outward profession and formality of worship, and the generality of men in most nations live as they did formally and are given up greatly unto those vices which were prevalent among them in their heathenism. A full evidence this is that the power of evangelical truth is lost among them, the efficacy thereof consisting in curing the vices of nature, and those evils which men have been most habituated to, as a prophet at large declares, Isaiah 11, verses 6 to 9. Thus the sin of this nation has been always esteemed sensuality of life, and an excess of eating and drinking, with the consequences of it. Hereunto of late have been added vanity and apparel, with foolish, light, lascivious modes and dressings therein, and an immodest boldness in conversation among men and women. These are corruptions which, being borrowed from the neighbor nation and grafted on crab stocks of our own, have brought forth the fruit of vanity and pride and abundance. And it is the most manifest evidence of a degenerate people when they are prone to naturalize the vices of other nations among them, but care not to imitate their virtues, if in any kind they do excel. But thus the lust of the eyes and the pride of life are joined to the lust of the flesh to give the world, as opposite to God, a complete interest among us. It may be these things are restrained in some by contrary vices as covetousness, and an earnest desire or ambition to enrich a family and leave a name amongst men. 
a vanity infused amongst mankind from the great design of the builders of Babel, which was to make unto themselves a name, Genesis 11.4. This is but another way of the exercise of the same sin. Now, where sins are thus national and common, it is easier for men to preserve themselves from the most raging epidemical disease than from being, in one degree or other, tainted with the infection of them. It is almost inexpressible how efficaciously they will insinuate themselves into the minds and lives of men. They are so beset on every side with the occasions of them and temptations to them, they offer themselves continually with so many specious pretenses is that there is no security against them but by being encompassed with the whole armor of God, a measure that few understand or apply themselves to. But it is not possible on any other grounds or by any other means for single persons to hold out and prevail against a national confederacy and sin. For they who will not say a confederacy to them or in those things wherein a whole people shall say a confederacy, must be content to be for signs and wonders, to be despised and even hooted at, Isaiah 8, 11, 12, and 18. However, it is apparent that by them the general apostasy we treat of is visibly and openly promoted. Some are engaged in them by a corrupt course of education, and some are betrayed into the entrances of them by sloth, negligence, and security. Some lose a sense of their guilt by their commonness. Some yield to the arguments that are pleaded, if not in their justification, yet in their excuse of, for their extenuation. One way or other, multitudes of all sorts are by them turned away from the gospel obedience. Hence, it has come to pass that Christianity is, as unto customs, manners, vanities, vices, and way of conversation, sunk down into heathenism, or prevalent national sins have drowned the power and left little but the outward form of it in the world. And where it is so, the life, substance, and all the real benefits of the gospel are renounced. For it doth not design only to turn men in their outward profession from dumb idols to serve the living God. To change the form and outward state of religion, as the Roman missionaries have made conversions of the Indians, giving them new images instead of their old idols, and new saints for their former zemes. But to turn men also from ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, where this is not effected, either the gospel never really prevailed among men, or they are fallen away from it. And where men do engage into a profession of religion, disallowing and condemning such national vanities, vices, and customs, if they are publicly countenanced, they occasion particular apostasies every day, this is that which, on the one side and the other, has almost lost the Protestant religion in some neighbor nations, for not being able to hold out against those national vanities and vices which are publicly countenanced. They find no relief under their minds but in a renunciation of that religion by which they are condemned. And this I look upon as the principal means of that general defection from evangelical holiness which prevails in most nations. The gospel comes upon a nation as on a wilderness or forest that is full of such wood, thorns, and briars as soil of itself is peculiarly disposed to produce. These it cuts down to the ground, planting good and noble plants in the room in which the barren wilderness becomes for a season a fruitful field, but in process of time, if continual care and culture be not used about it, the earth pours out its own accord the weeds and briars which are natural to it. These springing up abundantly choke the other plants and useful herbs in which the fruitful field is turned again into a wilderness. There needs no more unto this apostasy but that national vices, for a time suppressed by the power of the word, should overgrow the generality of any people whereby the graces of the gospel will be certainly stifled and choked. This is a reading from The Nature and Causes of Apostasy by John Owen, which can be found in his Collected Works of Volume 7, The First Treatise.